Thank you very much. So I'm very excited to be following Stephen Giordano because I feel like we're gonna turn a double play. I'm super pumped. So if you wanna follow along with some of the steps of Lexio Divina, it's on page 26 in your program, so you don't have to be too preoccupied about taking notes during this talk. Of course, you're welcome to do that, but you've got an outline already in your program. So this afternoon, I'm gonna talk with you about this particular type of prayer, Lexio Divina. It's a term that some of you may already be familiar with. It's a form of meditation that centers on a prayerful reading of sacred scripture. Now, why do we do this type of meditation? So that we can come to know God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but especially to focus and concentrate on the person of Jesus Christ. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that you cannot love what you do not know. In order to love our Lord, then, we must know him, and we come to know him through prayer, through meditation and contemplation. So think about it like this. We're all on this journey of discipleship, this intentional discipleship. How long did it take the apostles to get to know Jesus, right? They become the pillars of the church, but their formation doesn't happen overnight. It took time. They spent three years with him, traveling with Jesus through Judea, through Galilee, listening to him teach, watching him work in ordinary ways and extraordinary ways. They saw him suffer and die for the salvation of each soul, and then taught by him after the resurrection and by the Holy Spirit, who's dropping like grace bombs all over the place. They were able to interpret everything that he said and did in light of the Old Testament, and they give to the church the New Testament with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was and is the fulfillment of all God's promises in the Old Testament. So here the apostles are, they go out, they travel, they write, they preach, they taught, they heal, they were killed, and they converted the world. And Lexio Divina helps us to follow in their footsteps. It sounds like a daunting task, but it's ours to do. They began as 12, along with Mary, along with a few other women. And that was it. Is it any harder for us? No, no. But for us to walk in Jesus' shoes and to walk in the disciples' shoes, we have to know him whom we are preaching. Our love for him has to be manifest in our lives. And this is possible for us. It is precisely why the apostles continued the mission of Jesus and the church. So listen to these words from St. John the Apostle from his first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we saw it and we testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. So in St. John's mind, bringing people to Jesus Christ and through him to the Father is joy, joy. We have already been called. We've already been invited by Jesus to follow him. So now is the time to come to know and love him so that we can talk about him with others and live as other Christs in the world. Now, how can we make our love for Christ, our following of him, our faith in him, have strong, deep roots and be constant day in and day out? Think, for example, of St. Paul, right? No other apostle works as hard as St. Paul. No other apostle suffered in the mission field like St. Paul. Listen to how he describes it in his own words. This is from the second letter to the Corinthians. Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. 
Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, like this isn't enough, right? <laughs> apart from other things, there is the daily pressure upon me of the anxiety of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? This passage from the second letter to the Corinthians should make us marvel. How could he do this? How could one man sustain this kind of apostolic activity? How could he put up with such strenuous labor, physical sufferings, such fatigue, such misunderstanding? I mean, really, adrift for a whole day and night on the sea? I, I just don't know, right? So blessed Columba Marmion, who's a Benedictine abbot and spiritual master, he died in the 1900s, he wrote this. Ask Paul why he bears everything, even his being weary of life himself. Why, in all his trials, he remains united to Christ with a firmness so unshakable that not tribulation or distress or persecution or hunger or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, none of these can separate him from Jesus. He will reply to you because of him who loved us. So what sustains, strengthens, animates, stimulates him is the love Christ bears for him. He loved me and gave himself up for me. Caritas Christi urget nos, the, the love of Christ compels us. That is why he was willing, without reserve, without counting the cost, to deliver himself up for him, for the souls who were his conquest. And he said, I will most gladly spend and be spent myself. Columba Marmion writes, this conviction that Christ loves him gives us the true key to all the work of the great apostle. And this makes sense. What other possible explanation could there be, except for his love of Christ and his absolute conviction of Christ's love for him. And that same love, my dear sisters, has to be at the root of who we are and what we do as Christian women. Otherwise, we will fall away. It is the only thing that will keep us faithful and striving, growing in holiness day after day. If I am not convinced in Christ's love for me, of God's love for me, why am I here? So the question then is how do I grow in faith of his love for me and in my love for him? How do I follow St. Paul's example uh, and live out of this love? I have to get to know Jesus. Again, blessed Marmion, he says, we know about God's love by contemplating the mysteries of Jesus. If we study them with faith, he says, the Holy Spirit, who is infinite love, reveals deep things about them and leads us to the love that is their source. Right there, you have all the work of the interior life. You have the recipe for living as a disciple. Contemplate the mysteries of Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit lead you to the love that is their source, and then live deeply rooted in faith, hope, and love. If you do that, your life will be that of a disciple. So with that in mind, let's look at Lexio Divina as one way to contemplate the mysteries of Jesus. Of course, there are many ways to do this. For example, praying the rosary is a means of contemplation of the mysteries of Jesus. The reason we announce the mystery before the decade of Hail Marys is so that we focus our minds on that particular mystery for this small period of meditation. The Stations of the Cross are another example. We're meditating and contemplating on Jesus' passion, his free and total embrace of his sufferings out of love for us. The church as mother takes us by the hand and leads us 
through contemplation of the mysteries of Jesus through these instruments. So it may sound intimidating at first to think I have to contemplate the mysteries of Jesus, uh, but the church has given us the means to do so. So let's look at Lexio Divina. It may be a form of prayer that's unfamiliar to you right now, but I'm telling you it, be, it can be quite efficacious and it's also something that you can do at your own pace and on your own time. The time that works best for you depending on your own personal prayer life. So it's very helpful in that way. Now remember that to hear the word of God is a grace for us. And he will change us through his word if we are open to it. So a story from the Desert Fathers illustrates this point very well. There was a custom in the early centuries of the church for monks and hermits to dwell in the desert. And people from the city, the city dwellers, they called them, would go out to the desert and they would ask the spiritual father for a word of life, they called it. And usually that meant like spiritual counsel, spiritual discernment, and it was given in the form of a scripture passage that the person was expected to take memorize, and then bring back and live in the city. They had to put it into practice. Now one day, three men came to Abba Anthony, one of the Desert Fathers, and they said to him, Abba Anthony, speak to us a word of life whereby we may live. And the old man said to them, behold, you have heard the scriptures, and they are enough for you. So he's kind of testing them, right? And they said to him, we wish to hear a word from you also, O oh Father. So Abba Anthony said to them, It is said in the gospel, If a man strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. But they were upset, and they said, We cannot do this. So Abba Anthony said to them, If you cannot turn the other cheek, just continue to let the one cheek be smitten. And the men like pulled their beards and ground their teeth and they said, no, we cannot do this. We cannot do this. And he said, if you cannot even do this, do not hit the other one back when he strikes you. And they wailed aloud and they stamped their feet and they said, we cannot do this. And then the old man said to his disciples who were standing by, please make for these brethren a little boiled food for they are ill. So the men took their porridge, they ate their porridge, and they returned to the city. And the disciples were a little bit puzzled by this, like you are right now. And they said, why did we have to make them some food? And Abba Anthony said to them, because they are too weak to even hear the word of God. So to hear the word of God and to be desire, to desire to be formed by that word is already a grace for you. It is already the Holy Spirit working in your heart. God is already working, and that is a great comfort for us as we approach Lexio Divina. So, Lexio Divina developed out of the uh, Benedictine monastic tradition. So the monks would spend hours and hours a day using the scriptures. They would hear it at meals. They would hear it in the scriptorium, which was the room in the monastery where they copied the scriptures and other ancient literary works. They would hear it, uh, obviously, in the liturgy. But then they were expected to memorize scripture and speak it to themselves while they worked in the fields and out you know, in the orchards. So what happens to you when you do that? The word, the word of God begins to permeate the way I think and speak, the way I pray, the way I work, the way I live, the way I love. Eventually, after the monks had been doing this for centuries, the practice of Lexio Divina was codified by Guigo II. So he's the ninth prior of the Grand Chartreuse, which is the monastery that's featured in the documentary Integrate Silence, if you've seen that. If you've read the book, The Power of Silence by Cardinal Robert Serra, those meditations were written while he was at the Grand Chartreuse. So the ninth prior of that monastery codified Lexio Divina for us and we're still using it. If you're willing to pray with scripture, if you're willing to open your heart to receive God, he will form you. So be ready and ask for the desire. The first thing you need to do is prepare yourself. So find a place that's comfortable, but where you're not gonna fall asleep, where you can be relaxed and without distractions. So everything that we learned this afternoon from Stephen, 
apply it. Turn off your cell phone or put it away or whatever. No distractions, right? I would not pray with Lexio Divina on your phone because a book is a single purpose device and a phone is not. So use a Bible, okay? Um, it's nice if you can have a, a particular place in your apartment or your home where you can do this uh, in the same place at the same time every day, if that's possible, but at least to set aside some place where like, that's my Lexio Divina chair. Okay, great. So you're already in the mindset of listening, like that's my listening chair, perfect. So begin with a prayer of invocation to the Holy Spirit. I gave you some examples on page 26, or you can make one up if you want to, no problem. It should be simple, but you wanna place yourself in the presence of God intentionally. What does that mean? Accept to acknowledge that he is the Lord of my heart, my heart is open to hear him, and I take a moment to quiet myself and invite him to speak to me his word. Now the first step, officially, is Lexio. Okay, so that's like a no-brainer, right? Reading. In this step, we're invited to understand what the biblical text says in itself. Read it out loud, if you can. If you're um, in a church, don't like shout it, but maybe just murmur it to yourself. But you wanna involve as many senses as you can. So you're holding the book, sense of touch. You're speaking the words, you're using your mouth. You're hearing the words with your ears, wonderful. You want to let the word of God simply speak what it is. If you have a question about a meaning, you can look at a study Bible, like check a footnote, but don't chase down meanings. This is not Bible study time, okay? The text should simply be read and taken in without concerning ourselves with too many opinions about what it means. So Pope Benedict XVI wrote this in Verbum Domini. The key question here is, what does the biblical text say in itself? Without this, he writes, there is always a risk that the text will become a pretext for never moving beyond our own ideas. In other words, I'm reading what I want to hear into it. Just listen to the word. If something grabs your attention, whether in a good way or a bad way, underline it, uh, make a note, whatever, does anything in the passage cause a strong reaction in you? It can be even one word, because every word is precious. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, I think I was in temporary vows, so about four or five years in as a sister, I'm a revert. So I was away from the church, like far, far away, and then had a really super fast, super strong conversion, went boom, like, and I was in the convent in like three months. So it was huge. So um, I know that's a story in and of itself. Um, so I'm, I'm like four or five years in, right? And I'm doing my Lexio Divina and I come to the parable of the sower. We all know that parable. It's in all three of the synoptic gospels. And our Lord, by the way, says in the gospel according to Mark, the, gospel, the disciples ask him, well, what does this mean? And he's like, you haven't understood this one? How are you gonna understand any of them? He says that and I was like, oh, okay, I better pay attention, right? So we got the hard path, we got the rocky soil, we got the weeds and we've got the good soil and you're bearing fruit in the good soil 30, 60 and 100 fold, right? Okay, everybody's with me, good. So I'm a sister, right? So I automatically put myself in the good soil category and I'm like, okay, I think I'm at like 55%. So I need to bump up fruit production. Okay, so what's our Lord? <laughs> gonna say to me about that. So I'm reading along, doing my Lexio, da, 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 you know. So other seed, I come to this line. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they had not much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. And I could, I could feel it like, since they had no root. That was me. I had this fast, strong conversion, and here I am in the convent, but I was still rocky soil. And I was so preoccupied about already placing myself in the good soil category, right, that I was not even aware of my own heart. So I hear this, since they had no root, and I was like, 
I have no root. And then a lot of things about the things I was struggling in religious life made sense. Oh, it's because I don't have a root. I have no root. So uh, Lexio Divina was like, oh, sucked me in the stomach, so to speak. So pay attention to every word. Pay attention. Make a note and see what's going to unfold for you. The second step is meditation. Was this where you think quietly about why that particular word or phrase stood out to you? What was it about that phrase that caught your attention? Does it relate to some part of your life in a special way? Does it speak to something you are struggling with? You can use your imagination to picture this scene if that's helpful for you. And you want to think about the what and the why of your life in relation to this word. What does the biblical text say to me? That's the question that Pope Benedict places with this. Here, each person, he says, individually, but also as a member of the community, must let himself or herself be moved and challenged. This is where, in meditation, we engage with our responses to the word of God. So I had that immediate response of like, oh my gosh, I'm, I have no root. But I don't stay there. I have to look at why don't I have a root? What's going on? What have I overlooked? What practices have I not really embraced? If it makes me sad, if it makes me angry, if it makes me fearful, consoled, joyful, why is that? Why is the text doing that to me? What's going on in my life that prompts these responses? And what is God saying to me in that? So this brings you to step three, which is prayer or oratio. Now, all of this is prayer, but in this particular step, we want to pray to God about what has been revealed in our meditation. Do you need courage? Do you need patience? Do you need to thank him for something wonderful he has done for you? What is his will? So going back to my example of the rocky soil, my soil was rocky, okay. I had to first of all stop thinking of myself as having achieved a certain level of spirituality that was almost totally a fantasy. So it was like reality check. <laughs> Sister Anna Marie, okay. Then I had to, now this took more than just one Lexio Divina, okay, so then I had to figure out, with God's help, how to go deeper. Rather than thinking I was already deep, God, how do you want me to go deeper? How to get my heart, my life, my, my, my soil, so to speak, to be good soil, so that I could receive the seed Create a clean heart in me, O oh God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. Here, the question as posed by Pope Benedict is, what do we say to the Lord in response to his word? Prayer, as petition, intercession, thanksgiving, and praise, is the primary way by which the word transforms us. And remember, our personal relationship with God is the life of prayer. It's not emotional highs. It is not perfect outcomes in all that I do. It is not feeling God's presence all the time. The personal relationship with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the life of prayer. So this is from the Catechism 2565. In the New Covenant, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond measure with his son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. The grace of the kingdom is the union of the entire holy and royal trinity with the whole human spirit. The whole human spirit. Thus, the life of prayer is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and in communion with him. This communion of life is always possible because through baptism, we have already been united with Christ. So that's Catechism 2565. The final step is contemplatio, contemplation, to sit quietly with what has been revealed. And this may take a little time, and that's okay. Again, from Pope Benedict, Lexio Divina concludes with contemplation during which we take 
up as a gift from God, his own way of seeing and judging reality, and ask ourselves what conversion of mind, heart, and life is the Lord asking of us. So all of you know this. We are called to be women of prayer and women of action. We have to do something or put into practice what has been given us. That's a big part of what you're trying to do this weekend. The Pope Emeritus reminds us, we do well to remember that the process of Lexio Divina is not concluded until it arrives at action, which moves the believer to make his or her life a gift for others in charity. And that fits right in with the theme of this whole conference. How is the Lord asking me, who I am, where I am right now, to make a gift of my life for others in charity? The word of God is meant to transform our hearts, and it will if we become hearers and doers of the word. The point, of course, is that the word is supposed to make me change. The Bible is the only book that you don't read. The Bible reads you. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Remember that to allow the love of Christ to take root in our souls, we have to spend time with Jesus contemplating the mysteries just like the disciples did. They had three years with him. And the Gospels, the other writings of the New Testament and the Old Testament, allow us to recreate for ourselves that time of intimate formation with the Lord. And it can go on for your entire life. It should go on for your entire life. If we allow him to form us, then he will use us as his instruments, his co-workers and co-operators of grace in the lives of our family, friends, and colleagues. He will show us how to bring our unique and intimate friendship with Jesus into every part of our lives and into our world. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Thank you.